Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Welcome, dear listeners, to this, which is episode 200 of Anesthesia and Pain Management Success. Really exciting milestone and really excited to have special guest Dr. Tim Deere here to help us inaugurate it. Dr. Deere is an interventional pain physician. He is the CEO of the Spine and Nerve Center of the Virginias, which he founded in 1994. He is widely published. He is an endurance athlete. He is the founder of the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience, among many other things. And uh, really pleased to have you here, Dr. Day. To, do, huh, have you here today, Dr. Deer, to talk about Aspen and the journey that that has been over the last five years, and we're getting ready to have our fifth meeting here in July. So thanks for being here. Well, Justin, it's a great pleasure to be your 200th podcast guest, and uh, certainly and, um, proud of what you've done. You've done a great job and great work. I've listened to many of your interviews with people, and it's always enlightening to me. And to be back on the program is uh, certainly an honor for me. Thank you very Thank much you. for having me. Yeah, I, I was actually looking through the archives. So you first came on in uh, October of 2019 for episode 29, which seems like eons ago now. And then there was a COVID special there in the 40s when we were trying to figure out how to, like, what does this all mean? And is this the end of the world? And uh, yeah, so this, it's great to have a slightly lower pressure <laughs> conversation talking about the genesis of the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience and lots of uh, exciting developments there. So for starters, you know, I'm curious, you know, it's May, I was just saying, I'm here in Portland, the birds are singing, it's getting nice out. I'm curious what races you're training for right now, if any. Well, so, you know, this year's racing season, I did the Florida uh, Seaside Half Marathon, which I start every season off with. Nice. Uh, I won my age group, you know, but I'm, I'm going to be turning 59 soon. So that age group gets harder the closer yeah. you get to the next age group. So so I hung in there and won my age group. And I think I ran 132 or 133 and, and a little slower than I normally would run that race. But uh, then I, I did the Boston Marathon, uh, qualified for next year, my, my 18th Boston, 20th anniversary wow. of my first. I did the Puerto Rico uh, Half Ironman. So that's the three races that are in the books for the year. Had a good race down in Puerto Rico. I love Puerto Rico and the people there are so wonderful to me and my family. And I think we'll always go back there to support Puerto Rico. And then uh, coming up, Badwater 135. And I'm, I really cranked up my training. I'm pretty muscular right now. I was up to 216 from lifting weights and doing boot camp. And so now I'm on my journey back down to 196 for the race. I hope I, I finished Badwater twice. Both times weighing over 200 pounds. I think the only person ever to finish Badwater over 200 pounds, as far as I know. Yeah, but I'm going to drag it down to about one. If you're not skinny at the beginning of Badwater, you'll be skinny by the end, for sure. <laughs> I lose about 15 pounds to 20 pounds during the race, and then uh, slowly bring that back up. And uh, so, yeah, it does pick it off. Then I've got Ironman Nice, which is the world championship for men this year. Awesome. And then I've, I've finished the season with the uh, Marine Corps Marathon, which I haven't ran since. Uh, 2002 when I ran my first marathon I think this is probably up to around 100 now so it's uh wow. it's uh, gonna be how I finish my season that'll be my a race I'll try to crush uh uh the uh, marine Corps uh, try to go down around 305 or so hopefully cool so for our listeners if you haven't ever heard of it you should google the badwater 135 uh it is a, a mind-boggling super or uh ultra marathon that is essentially like in the desert in California starts down at the bottom of death Valley and goes to the top of Mount Whitney or something like that. I don't know if I'm making up. That's pretty much it. And most point the USA up to the the highest in the portal of Mount Whitney. So yeah, that's it. That's you summed it up. Well, yeah. So, uh, that's, I can only imagine that that is, uh, suffering on another level. (laughs) It brings your mind and your body and your soul all in one place and they're all Mm. in a bad spot. And then, yourself out of it so it actually is a great mind exercise uh, mm-hmm. um, to get your mind body and soul back out of that hole you go into as it gets on 135 130 degrees at some points there so uh i, I love it uh it's my favorite race and uh honored to be going back for the third time so uh, we'll see how it goes uh as somebody who has heard a number of other endurance athletes and some of the podcasts i'm curious if you've ever interacted with david goggins yeah, so Goggins last in, in 21, I won the I was the fastest person over the age of 50. You know, Badwater is the ultra running world championship in some circles. And and so I was the fastest person over 50. Goggins was supposed to be there. And uh and he um 
backed out nearly about a week before the race. So I don't know what happened to him. I did run into him at Leadville once, uh, at the Leadville 100 uh, trail run, something a great specimen of a person and uh, very impressive. And yeah. so I had a brief conversation with him at Leadville. Uh, out is he Colorado, as much of a so. caricature of himself in person as he is when he's like on the record? Uh, uh, I think he's really an impressive person. I think Goggins is a, you know, because he's had to fight so hard his whole life to get what he wants. I think he has a fighting attitude all the time. Yeah. I don't know if he can turn that off. So uh, he's, he's not, I think some people would find him not approachable. I approach, I approach him quite easily because, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, I, I have some of the same mindsets that he has. And well, he, he faced racism in Indiana, you know, by his, by his biography, I grew up in Appalachia as a poor coal miner's son. So, you know, I mean, we've all gone through our struggles. So I kind of relate to him in that way. And I, I uh, so, yeah, but he is not, a lot of people find him very unfriendly. I thought he was very friendly, actually. Hmm. But I think sometimes people that seem unfriendly, they really just want to be treated like a normal person. So I just walked up to him and said hi and shook his hand and we talked for a little bit. And uh, and like I said, he I, I was ready to race him in the Gobi Desert and he backed out uh, a week before the race. And it was, 21 was the hottest bad water ever. Uh, it was in the high 120s. And so I, I, I don't know if that's why he backed out or not, but uh, I was very disappointed. This year, I don't think he's on the list. So uh, I don't know if I'll ever race David again, but uh, I raced him once and once he didn't show up, but um, he uh, he had a tibiostomy of his knee. And so I don't know, he stood on Moab, which is a 240 mile run, but you can walk most of that. You don't have to really run much of that. So as far as things like Badwater, where you really have to, if you're going to do well there, you have to run probably a hundred miles of that 135 at least. Um, and I don't know if he can do that with that to be honest with me or not. So we'll see. But uh, Goggins is uh, one of the most impressive humans I've ever seen. And uh, I certainly think if you haven't, if you don't know his story, Reed can't hurt me and actually listen yeah. to the audio book. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's got bad language. In it though, Justin, so if you're offended easily, I'm not sure you should listen to it. Good to know. I, uh, I was listening to another interview with like some, uh, tech exec, you know, CEO type. And they're asking like, how do you stay motivated? What do you do when you're fighting distraction or whatever? And he's like, I just, I really just get on YouTube and look at David Goggins videos and have him yell in my face for two minutes about how I need to like, you know, get it together. And then I get back and get back to work. So that was funny and something that I very much uh, resonates with me. Um, so today I'd like to talk about Aspen, the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. When we last spoke, it was essentially a fledgling organization. And what I've seen in the last handful of years is it's, there's immense momentum. And I remember I had a uh, conversation back when I was sort of getting oriented to the world of pain management a few years ago. Uh, with a, a pain management friend in Philly. And I said, you know, I was like, well, tell me about ASIP and tell me about NANS and trying to like get the vibe. And I was like, so tell me about Aspen. I know that's this new thing. And he just gets this big grin. He's like, Aspen is the best thing going right now. And so just proceeds to tell me how it's like, you know, this organic organization and people collaborating in a way that was unique amongst the societies and all that. So I'm curious in terms of like, how, why does Aspen exist? How did it come about? And at what point were you like, we need to build something that isn't out there right now? You know, Justin, I think that's a, a great question. And, you know, I've been around organized medicine for a long, long time. I was very involved with the American Society of Anesthesiology early in my career, became the chairman of the pain division, been involved with every society you've named so far in some way on the board of or president of INS and other things. And I always found these things were very bureaucratic and well, many of those studies are very good, and I'm still mem a member, and I still think they're they have great attributes and and things. I thought they really weren't meeting meeting the goal that I had, and the goal I had for a society was that we just really made the field better by helping each other, not by you know uh, giving politicians a bunch of money and doing a bunch of political action, although that's very important. Not by you know. Um, getting involved in, in the politics of AMA and Rocky and, and all those things that are created payment, which is very important. So I think all those things are very important, but I thought really what we needed was to take a group of people, young, old, you know, male, female, uh, whatever gender you may be, whatever race or creed or color religion, and really put all that together instead of aside, bring it together and say, we embrace you all. And our main goal is to make you a better doctor. If you're young, we want an older person to mentor you. If you're old, we want a younger person to mentor you and teach you. It's a reverse mentoring, which I get all the time from younger doctors. We want to focus on social media and messaging. And we want to focus on, you know, really uh, bringing people up from the podium to the, you know, 
from a poster to a podium like Erica Peterson's done. Mm -hmm. We got a couple of big things coming soon. Just, I can't tell you about today because we have an embargo on uh, public relations. We got a couple of big projects that are going to be nationwide projects that will make national news at that. And that comes from collaborating with a bunch of our members who have interest outside of pain, but interest in, into other organizations. So we're really trying to, to reach out outside of our community normally and work with orthospine and work with neurosurgery and work with interventional radiology. And so the other thing about aspirin has been kind of unique. You know, I think many of the studies are either anesthesia based or, or physiatry based or surgery based, and they often fight, you know, and there's always turf battles and wars. We've really worked hard with our collaboration council to bring all the specialties into one umbrella and say, listen, whoever the best person is for that patient at that time and that patient continuum that's what we should do. And I think, so the other unique thing, and it's a long answer to your question, but the other really unique thing we've done, I think very well, but we're not done yet. We got ways to go and miles to walk before we sleep. And I'll talk about Neuron, our new project in a moment mm -hmm. to accomplish, accomplish this. We're trying to bring all the other specialties that have an interest in spine and nerve disease in the same tent to work together, not apart to, to really get access because the, the enemies, usually the insurance company, uh, and not the other specialties. And usually the insurance company just want good data and I don't blame them. So even though I call them the enemy, they're not really the enemy. They just want us to prove to them what we do is valuable. Right. Uh, I'm curious, you know, Aspen in its current form, uh, is this kind of what you envisioned five years ago? And this was sort of on the back of a napkin, you and Dr. Sayed, you know, at some session after a conference, whatever, whatever however it, it began. Um, how how have things unfolded as far as like what you were hoping? Yeah, it really is what I envisioned. Um, and, and and by that, what I mean is when I go to that conference in July and I walk in and I see all kinds of people that, that are in residency and fellowship and just out of fellowship and, you know, in their first five years of practice, they're with excitement in their eyes, wanting to get better and better and better. And then they say to me, hey, Tim, have you learned this yet? And then they start teaching me things. And then I see, you know, one of my friends walk in who's in his 60s and he teaches them something about practice management that they didn't know. And then another person walks in who's in industry and they, they teach them something about, you know, leadership that they didn't know. Because really, the other unique thing about Aspen, in my opinion, is we've really em embraced industry. You know, I, I've heard a lot, of, a lot of studies make industry, quote, the bad, the bad guys. You don't want to collaborate with those people, but you, but you ask them for a lot of money. And what we've done is, We've been very transparent. We've embraced the knowledge of industry because, you know, if you work for a company that spends all your time doing research and development for a product, you put a lot of effort into getting good outcomes. And so, so I think it, it, you asked me if it's what I thought it would be. It's the youth, it's the excitement, it's the collaboration, but also it's, it's, it's really all tense, including scientists and in industry and physicians and people like yourself who really have outreach to communities. So we are really trying to, trying to, to be really a tenth of all people. So yes, that is what I wanted. Exactly. And then we're going to expand that internationally now, which is our next big project. Hmm. With regards to industry partnership, I, that is one thing that I've noticed, you know, obviously pain is a, a specialty where, where the, the R and D and the science is largely driven in partnership with industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of those relationships and creating an organization Aspen that is a little bit, I mean, it's, it's very inclusive as far as the, the way that doctors and industry and all, I mean, even somebody like me at the, the finance guy, how, how we all interact in the same sort of swimming pool. Well, I mean, finance guys are so important to us. I'll give you an example. I, I just uh, finished a, a couple of calls with some venture capitalists to raise money to help the next research project for some charter companies. Um, I just had the CEO of uh, one of the, the vice companies here, Saluda, when he announced his $150 million raise for that company. So without that partner with finance people, there wouldn't be those research projects and those, those uh, development projects and those new devices. So it's really all those people are important. And, you know, as you know, I've been friends with a lot of people involved in finance and venture capital and funding as well. Uh, what we believe is, you know, we believe that there's been a really a lot of hypocrisy in the field. You know, and you say, you know, we have no conflicts, but that yet industry has paid for the exhibit halls and the hotel rooms and the flights. And so there's been, quote, no conflict, but there's been a lot of conflict. 
And so we we really believe that we shouldn't try to be hypocritical. We should be really open and transparent and embrace the relationships that are there in a transparent way so people can make be judged. Uh, is there really uh, a objective fashion? At the same time, we put controls on. And what I mean by that, for example, our new neuron projects, which is uh, a living consensus project. We're doing 10 of those in the next 18 months. We're starting with our first ones now, which we can talk about. That'll be very, they'll change the field. But in those projects, we have a, a group of referees that do not work with industry in any way, who's going to go look at every paper and every paragraph. Is there bias there? We've also asked people to recuse themselves from any decision-making um, for the things like the annual program or these papers. If there's a decision made and you have any conflicts, you don't participate. You know, that's worked really well for us. We've had uh, transparency and recusal. And I think that's really where we need to be. And um, I think to, to ignore the fact that we work together physicians, nurse practitioners, researchers, companies, finance people, to ignore that fact is crazy because we do work together, as you know. We, we know. we all need each other to help patients. And if one piece of that falls out, we're not going to make it. We need all those pieces to get to the end point, which is a good, safe, effective product that goes through the FDA and gets FDA approval. Yeah. And if you don't have all those pieces to get you to that point, you're not going to get to that point and help patients. So I think it's really important that we embrace all groups in a transparent and, and really uh, progressive way with, with really the goal of the patient being the center of all that focus into the patient at the end of the day. You're obviously no stranger to organizational leadership, having done that for most of your professional career in conjunction with your clinical work. I'm curious for Aspen as you were starting things, you know, in its nascency, and then as things developed and gained complexity. Um, talk to me about how you just manage delegation, organization, like how do you keep everything straight in addition to seeing a bunch of patients and serving with, on other boards of other societies? Like, how, what are the mechanics for you of operationalizing something that is new and also growing in complexity while you have all these competing interests? Yeah, I've been pretty blessed to be surrounded by good people my whole career. So um, I, I'm surrounded by good people in my practice. So I have wonderful partners, nurses, nurse practitioners, secretarial teams. So that's helpful. Uh, I, I'm also been blessed by surrounded by good people in the society. So, you know, I've had Dawood Sayad as my vice chairman in the last several years. Uh, we've had Jason Pope as our president until July. He's done a phenomenal job. Erica Peterson, neurosurgeon, coming in to take his place. And Jason will become past president. Kristan Chakavarthi, become president-elect uh, in July. Steve Falowski behind him. You know, uh, our scientific team, Kazra Madoff, I'm David Lee. Our, our social media team, Natalie Strand, you know, um, uh, Anthony Gafridi. We, we just have such great people everywhere I look, you know, Justin, that it makes my job easy. So what I do, I, I, I'm a big picture person now. I, I'm able to be the big picture person. So I looked at, we need a, a new, I've done a lot of consensus guidelines in my career. They've been written in, two, I'll give you an example. They're written in 2018. They get edited and reviewed and they're published in 2021. And, by, and they're already outdated almost. And then they don't get updated for four more years. I think that's a bad process. So our new process with Neuron, is going, I'm just giving you an example of how, I've, how what roles I've changed. We're going to create consensus guidelines today, publish them within 12 months. And then update those annually as we go forward by young people, uh, our young innovators. They'll lead, they'll lead updates annually every single year uh, until the next one's published. And they'll look at the new evidence. So that's a that's a big picture thing. Uh, we're going to ISPN, our first meeting in Dubai in December, our first international meeting. That's that's a big picture thing that I thought of. We need to be, become more international. And then the, we'll be announcing next week, and I'm not going to tell you uh, whom yet, but next week we'll be announcing a partnership with the Latin American Pain Society. They'll they'll come in and be our Latin American component of Aspen, which will be uh, called LASPEN, uh, Latin American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. Um, and that'll be very important as well. Well, that sounds awesome. Um, tell me more about Neuron and is it an inter-specialty thing? It sounds pretty organic. It sounds like, you know, it, tell us more about how that works. Yeah, let's talk about Neuron. So you may know that, you know, in 2008, I took over NAC and PAC from my friend Sam Hassenbush. Dr. Hassenbush was a neurosurgeon from MD Anderson, 
who had ran the neuromodulation consensus conferences and polyalgesia consensus conferences. Well, actually, he ran PAC, and there wasn't a NAC yet. I created a NAC in 2014. That was a, something that came out of my mind when I was president-elect of, of, of the International Neuromodulation Society. And those guidelines have been very important, and they really helped change the field. Um, but they, they really were, uh, again, they've been very helpful, but they've also been very long to produce. They've been very um, um, almost political in the selection of people. And they've been very um, complicated in the process. So I learned from that. And so with Aspen, I really felt we needed, number one, a simpler process. We needed, um, you know, a diverse group of people, uh, men, women, academics, private practice, orthospine, neurosurgery, interventional radiology, pain. And when needed, like, for example, in our peripheral neuropathy paper, uh, diabetic neuropathy uh, experts. So I thought we needed all those people. We needed to have our consensus points in the beginning of the document. What really do we all think is important based on what the current literature says? And then show in each section the, the evidence scored very carefully with a, a judge for evidence. John Hagedorn is going to be playing that role for the first few papers. Um, it's going to show really why we came to our consensus point based on the evidence. And then what we're going to do is once that's published, and it'll be published within 12 months of the, cre- of the start of the project. So the, the, the data will be no more than one year old when published. Then we're going to have an annual, probably two page update by a group of younger physicians and they'll lead the next round of updates. And for the next three, probably three years or every year, they'll have any new articles published that would change potentially our consensus. They'll publish what those articles are and they'll say, this may change consensus because of blah, blah, blah. Now it's not going to change the consensus because it's not a consensus. It's a living update of the consensus. But then when we get to that next round of updates, we will have the literature search is already done, if you will. We've already been every year reviewing what came out new. And we write that new paper in 2027. And it's like, okay, here's a new consensus based on what we've seen. Now, we may find some therapies fall off and they, they, we find they don't work. The new paper show they didn't work. Then the consensus says, don't do that anymore. But a, a good example is that we're going to have a consensus on non-surgical back pain for stimulation. And, you know, the study that I most recently led with James Yu, who's an ortho spine surgeon from Connecticut, it's half neurosurgery and ortho and half pain. And uh, so that paper is going to be half neurosurgery and ortho and half pain. And, and so that's, that's an example of what we're trying to accomplish. So I think you're going to see specialties come together more. And that leads to, I think, better care, because I think this, this bracketed specialty thing has been really non-productive. And um, the, we've had some societies uh, like North American Spine, which has had mostly surgeons with a few anesthesiologists. But I, I really think that we're different in that culture there because we're we're not, we're really looking at the spectrum and not saying what's the bigger procedure. And sometimes the right answer is going to be a smaller procedure. And I think if we all come to that conclusion, then we'll know that's the right thing to do, and, as opposed to everyone needs a fusion, for example. Understood. Um, I'm curious, as things have developed, if any parts of what Aspen has become have surprised you? Either well, the upside I, I, or the downside. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I think there's really been, I think the only surprise I've really had truly is the talent that's out there. Um, you know, I knew there were talented people, but, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, Patrick Buchanan, who I didn't really know, get to know him. He, he wants to start a podcast. Maybe we can have you on as a guest, but he wants to start a podcast. And he started talking to me about some of his thought processes around that. And I was kind of surprised at the depth in which he understood many categories. Uh, Noam Nazim became our leadership uh, director. And he started talking about digging deep into, you know, bringing nurse practitioners, things like that in. And he had a knowledge base that shocked me. You know, there, I mean, I knew he was a smart guy, but that's an example. Uh, I talked to people uh, like Sandy Christensen about uh, tr- translational science. And, you know, she's out, in, I think, in your, in Oregon, where you are, and talking to her and, you know, really learning there's so many things out there that are way outside my scope. So I think really the, the talent has me. There's so many talented people out there. I could go on and on and name 150 people that, that I, I was, they taught me things that I didn't know. And then I think that nothing negative really has really shocked me or surprised me at all. I think, uh, you know, we, we've kind of ignored negativity 
Um, I think you either can can embrace it and let it bring you down and make you mad and angry and and fight and all those things and be and be bitter, or you can just ignore people that are haters and <laughs> and keep doing your work. So the philosophy of Aspen has been to ignore haters, think about the patient, think about the specialty, advance the field. And that's made me pretty happy. So I think what, what surprised me is maybe if I have a surprise on the negative side is that haters haven't hurt us in any way, shape or form. And uh, that will continue because we have a bigger purpose than getting bogged down in uh, politics or, you know, uh, who's, who's the best society or who's the best people. We hope all societies do well. We, we get, we're here for, for really ourselves to, to do well. And if everybody else does well, that's great too. Are there any uh, unique areas of opportunity uh, where you think Aspen is well positioned to fill a need or to grow or to develop younger physicians uh, and areas well, of, like, uh, yeah. that Aspen is moving toward that you're excited about right now? Oh, absolutely. I think we're making great progress internationally. You know, again, as I pointed out, Aspen, December uh, 8th in Dubai, we're going to get a lot of people from the Middle East, from India, from Asia. We haven't really touched before. They've gone to meetings uh, where they talk about implantable devices and things, but they haven't gone to a meeting that talks about everything from diagnoses all the way through to the end of the spectrum. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to be reaching out more to Latin America. You know, again, we're going to be making a big announcement about Latin America the next week. We're going to be reaching out to a, a group of people in America that I can't talk about yet. That's uh, going to be national news. Uh, and we're going to change some treatment paradigms. From some people have been injured in the United States. That's going to be big. And I'll, hopefully I can make that announcement in the next two weeks. That's an opportunity. And I think the biggest opportunity for me, though, truly, is that we've been really working hard on young innovators. It's growing like crazy. And I think that's going to create a community, Justin, the, uh, people that long after I retire, and hopefully I'll be sitting on the on the beach somewhere, although that sounds kind of terrible to me. I don't think I'll ever do that. But running on the beach but, somewhere. You know, after I retire, I think these people are going to keep advancing new therapies. You know, I think about where I was in '94 and what we have today. All the things I do, the things I've done in the last two days that wasn't available before. That's because of young doctors working with people to develop, like engineers, to develop new things. This young group of innovators we have at Aspen, probably seven or eight hundred people in that young innovators group. They are brilliant people. And the ones that aren't very brilliant, they have other skills. You know, let's say they're not the brightest person in that group. Well, then they have personality skills. They have hard work skills. So we're going to see this group of people that work together. So I think that of all those things I talked about, I think the outreach to international communities to improve patient access and the young innovators work together to change the field over the next 25 years will be the big legacies of our specialty in our, our society. Can you talk more about the Young Innovators Program and what that is? Yeah, Young Innovators is a program we developed, and, and you know it really uh, centers around taking people in their first five years. We always say, but you know we've been a little flexible. We've had people a little bit older than that want to come into it. We've had a lot of people that are still med students want to come into it that really want to get involved in the latest things. And what I mean by that is, if there's a, a research coming up and, and you want to get involved, you can work together to develop a team to write, uh, you know, meta-analysis. You can work together with some of the um, older physicians in our, our society. Get involved in level one studies. If your center, for example, doesn't have a ability to do a level one study, but you really have an interest, then you can partner with someone who's got a level one study at their facility, let's say like a Dalwood Syed at Kansas, and really get involved in some of these things and, and learn about how to do it. So the next study that comes along, wherever you're practicing, you can do that. You can go out and visit your colleagues. You can do site visits with people like myself. You can go in and, 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 and meetings really bounce off problematic cases off each other and really learn what the best you know best management might be. So it's a, it's a mixture of sharing ideas, uh, consulting with each other, helping each other on projects, writing together. You know, and then we we've seen some of those young innovators actually become very good social friends, and and that's actually that sounds kind of maybe off kilter, but it's really not. Because you need that social network because we know that if you think about your your happiness, your health, and your longevity, work's really important. What you eat and diet, exercise is really important. But that social network that you create is so important for your mental stability and for your success. So I think the, the social part of that young innovators part has been very fun to watch. 
And uh, the other thing about young innovators, and we got some senior advisors, young innovators, we got some some people in leadership, and we've got a lot of people just to come along to be part of the, the team. One thing that's really kind of cool to watch is that, you know, it's really been a almost like a, a, a bullion base of people. And what I mean by that, we got, we got neurology residents and surgery residents and people in their first year or two that's a, a neurosurgeon. We have somebody in Morgantown recently came to visit me and he joined as a, he's going to lead the neurosurgery division of Young Innovators. We've got, you know, people that are are, are really strictly private practice with no research interest and don't want to speak, but love being part of the communication. So it's just really a big mixture of people. And I think that's what Aspen's all about. Uh, I talked to you the last week or the week before on the podcast about how something that I think business people like myself get intuitively, they get beat into them actually like from the first day of undergrad is the importance of networking and how building relationships with people who do what you do and who are better at what you do than you are and who are more you know advanced in years and have the perspective like that is so critically important. And I think I have found Aspen to be a really valuable place to get to know other, you know, you said in the past, like nice people, like-minded people, people that are supportive and encouraging. And uh, so for anybody listening who's thinking like, oh, what does it mean for me to develop my career strategically and to make connections that are going to be valuable to me and also to be a contributor? Um, I have just really enjoyed being part of the Aspen community. Um, coming up here, July 14th to 17th, for anybody who's listening in Miami, if you are thinking, man, I wish I could really develop my network, build some of these connections with other physicians and industry people. Um, come hang out with Dr. Deer and co and me, and, uh, would love to see you there. Any other words, Dr. Deer in parting? No, I think I will remind people if you do come to Aspen, again, there's good opportunity on the 13th, it means the 14th and 17th, but if you do come down there at South Beach, it's the, at the, um, uh, Fountain Blue Hotel, which is probably getting close to sold out, but Eden Rock next door is going to have some rooms that we also have for overbooking. But but on Friday, we have the 5K for charity. And this year, some of our charities are uh, the Challenge Athlete Foundation, which we raise money for those who are trying to get back into sport, who've been paralyzed or lost a limb. You know, uh, we had a, a young man that involved last year with, with uh, Down syndrome who, who did a bunch of uh, uh, endurance sports that made national news. Uh, so I think that's one of the charities we're sponsoring um, St. Jude Children's Hospital. We've, we've sponsored. That's one of those charities we sponsor through some of our races we have, and then uh, the Ironman Foundation, which does great work around the world. Uh, a lot of that's health based work too, as well, but through Iron Aid. So, so if you do come, if not, we're going to have a virtual five k. So, contact Justin or myself, and we'll get you involved in that. If you donate fifty dollars, get a t shirt from the race, and help people around the world. So that's very important. And then we're going to have a Saturday night charity, um, a white dance, white party where people wear white clothing at the beach and. And uh, actually, we have DJ Leo Caporal, uh, world famous pain physician, but at night he's a DJ. We're going to be raising money for charity there as well. So, and, and that was a great time last year. Everyone kind of teaming up to help others. So, it's not just about the meeting, it's not just about science, which would be very important. The last thing I'll say about that meeting, Justin, our first kickoff of the meeting will be the science hour where Rick Pacius and Kate Meacham will lead a discussion of, of transitional uh, basic science and pain. And I think that first hour is going to set the tone for the meeting and that even though we do a lot of clinical work, we know that the, the benchmark of everything we do comes back to science. So those the, the, the races, the charity dance, and the uh, science of it all are some of the things I want to, want to highlight as we close here. Sounds like a good time. Dr. Deer, thank you very much for coming around again to the APM Success Podcast. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Well, I certainly will come anytime you ask, Justin. It's a pleasure to be here with you and I look forward to seeing you in South Beach. Sounds good. Take care. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com, where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.